Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, August 8th, 2021. We are still in Unit 3, uh, which is entitled, Faith Gives Us Hope. And that hope is not something that we wish for. It is a confident expectation. Faith gives us hope. Uh, we're in Lesson 10. And from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, the lesson title is The Examples of Heroes. Our devotional reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 to 40. Our background scripture is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, and then chapter 13, verse 1 to 19. And our printed or lesson passage is Hebrews 11, verse 1 to 8, and then verse 13 to 16. Our key verse from the King James Version is, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That is Hebrews 11, verse 1. Lesson aims from the quarterly or, number one, identify the faith contribution of the heroes in Hebrews 11. Number two, value people in your lives who act heroically through faith. And number three, grow in your potential to become faith heroes. I'm Deacon Barry Taylor, and we are going to give a little background, uh, have a brief prayer, and then get into our lesson verse by verse. Before that, though, I, I need to mention that from the quarterly the lesson after the introduction, the lesson has three divisions. The first is entitled Faith's Existence. That's covered between Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and 3. Second division is entitled Faith's Example. That's covered between verses 4 and 8. And then the third is Faith's Endurance. That's covered between Hebrews 11, verse 13 and 16. From the Standard Commentary, our lesson title is A Necessary Faith. A Necessary Faith. And very briefly, additional aims are, number one, state the definition of faith. Number two, explain the meaning and significance of the key verse. And then number three, list one change in each of the categories of thought, behavior, and speech by which he or she, that's me or you, will become more of a stranger to this world. As I said, we're going to give a little background and then we're going to dive in with some verse by verse, uh, hopefully exposition, uh, within the context of the, uh, the larger uh, book, entire epistle. Well, first, let me say uh, the book of uh, or epistle letter uh, to, uh, entitled Hebrews uh, has an unknown author. I know many uh, like to think that Paul authored the book, but uh, it is uncertain as to who the author was. What we do know is that he had a pretty thorough uh, understanding of the history of the Jews uh, and their culture and of course the current culture, uh, which of course was dominated by Rome. Uh, he also, uh, uh, it, it's also believed uh, that the book was written between 80, 67, and 69. There's some details that suggest that date, that range uh, of dates, uh, years that it was uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, written during the uh, the book the epistle is a, a progression uh, beginning at verse one uh, it it actually uh, is I think was intended to convince the Jewish believers Jewish Christians of why Christianity was better than the Jewish uh, tradition the Jewish uh, what the Jewish uh, customs and traditions had been beginning at verse 1 um, the author explains that Christ is better than angels uh, he goes on to 
to say he's better than Moses, he's better than the Aaronic priesthood, he has a superior priesthood, and that he made a superior and eternal sacrifice, and that his priesthood was like Melchizedek, who uh, had an eternal, who had no beginning, had an eternal priesthood. And when we get into chapter 10, he talks about uh, saving, uh, that our saving is by faith, through faith, see that uh, between verses 19 and 25 and then he talks about false faith he begins to talk about that Hebrews chapter 10 uh, verse 26 and concludes uh, at verse 39 talking about false faith in fact as he winds up chapter 10 uh, he is talking about uh, living by faith uh, uh, the endurance that is needed let me back up to verse 36 of chapter 10 and read and this is from the New King James Version for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God you may receive the promise for yet a little while and he who is coming will come and will not tarry verse 36 I mean verse 38 rather says now the just shall live by faith but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And verse 39, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. That, that, how, that's how we ended chapter 10. And then we begin um, verse 1 of chapter 11 with a definition of faith. He's talking about living by faith, uh, that we are to live by faith. We know that comes from the back. Uh, and he begins with a chapter 11 with a definition of faith. So let's go before the throne. Father, we do thank and praise you for yet another uh, opportunity to study your precious word. Lord, as always, we pray that you give us a clear understanding of your word, Lord. And as we understand your word, we pray that our faith would be increased. And as our faith is increased, we pray that our obedience to your word would be increased, Lord. We thank you for all those who are listening, who are desirous of understanding your word and your will better. And we just pray that you'd help us, Lord, to apply what we learn today. Uh, and each time we open uh, your, your word, Lord, to our lives, Lord, to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, for those of you who are not familiar with my teaching style, I, I like to teach verse by verse, uh, and uh, I do what is called expository teaching, that is to expose the meaning of each verse within the context of the passage. Um, so we're going to start with uh, verse 1, and remember this first division of the standard, I'm sorry, of the quarterly is entitled Faith's Endurance. The division, the first division of the standard is entitled The Meaning of Faith. Verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And by the way, I'm going to go back and forth between the King James Version and the NIV as needed for, I think, greater clarity. And just rereading that verse in the NIV says, Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So uh, we want to just break this verse apart here when it says in the King James, it is the substance the NIV said it's the confidence. It is, uh, and I believe it is what we, whatever it is that we are uh, desirous of having or attaining, it is the reality of that. Uh, and when it says hoped for, uh, we often in our uh, modern usage of hope. Uh, think of it as something we wish for, but uh, as it's used in the Bible, it means a confident expectation of receiving something or a confident expectation of the reality of something uh, that, that is going to come to pass. 
one of the commentators says this substance is uh, perhaps better defined as basis or uh, for trust or conviction. Uh, that is what this substance is, the basis for our conviction. Um, and uh, put in a uh, uh, financial, using a financial metaphor, it's like a, a down payment on something, putting a down payment on something, and that down payment being the evidence of uh, or assurance that payment is going to be made in full, proof that uh, payment is eventually going to be made in full. And we know the earnest, uh, the, the down payment that Christ has made uh, in our full uh, salvation, the uh, deliverance from the, the, the presence of sin. We know that salvation has three aspects or phases. It is, first of all, deliverance from the penalty of sin, and that's eternal separation from God. Deliverance from the power of sin, and that's the sanctification through the Holy Spirit or through the power of the Holy Spirit, and then ultimately the very uh, deliverance, or deliverance from the very presence of sin, and that is our glorification when we go to be with Christ. So in summarizing that verse, or my comments on that verse, uh, it, faith is the evidence, it is the, it is the proof, it is the substance of what we have a confident expectation of receiving uh, that is what faith is now we go on to verse 2 and it reads for by it the elders obtain a good report the elders being those their ancestors those who would come before and now he, the author is going to go on to list several of them by name and then a group of them who demonstrated faith, uh, living by faith uh, even though they didn't living by faith, even though they did not live to see the promises delivered on. So what does he mean by obtained a good report? Uh, from the Greek the verb means to witness, or they uh, were a good witness, if you will, uh, or to testify of something, to the truth of something. Uh, and who did they testify to the truth of something to? Well, certainly they demonstrated their faith uh, to all who knew them, uh, but the good report came from God. God is the one that gave them a good report. We'll see later where he says he was not ashamed to be their God because of the witness of their faith, because they lived by faith and because they died in faith. Moving on to verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear or things which are seen or made by things that are unseen. So the writer goes back to the very beginning of uh, the known creation uh, and explains that everything that we can see in creation was made by what we cannot see and actually Cause to come into existence by the Word of God. Uh, and uh, we need to understand that um, the sum total of reality uh, is not limited to what we can see. Uh, we know that the microscopes and telescopes uh, reveal things that are not visible to our naked eyes. Nevertheless, those things uh, are uh, real and they, they, they have real effects on our lives um, and it's, it's like that in a spiritual sense too in fact the things that are not seen are more significant than the things that are seen the spiritual realm is of much greater significance than what we can see which is perishable which perishes away the things that are not seen are eternal
But but what is the author saying though? He, he's saying through faith we understand this. Okay, uh, uh, Psalm 14 says, "A fool has said in his heart there is no God." There are some uh, fools in the world today that uh, don't believe that uh, all that we see was created. They believe that it just came into existence. Uh, that there was a big bang. Uh, uh, notwithstanding, they never try to explain who caused the bang, but. Uh, they believe that uh, in the in the natural world that has always existed uh, and had no cause, which is foolishness. By faith, we understand that what we see was created by what we do not see, and that the Word of God uh, caused everything to come into existence. Ex nihila, that is, uh, He made all from nothing. Verse four. Now we're moving into the second division from this quarterly, it's faith's example. And uh, verse 4 reads, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it he being dead yet speaketh. I'm going to reread that in the uh, NIV for, for clarity here. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Now, we know about the uh, the story of Cain and Abel. We go back to Genesis chapter 4 and we can read about uh, what what is briefly mentioned of Abel. Uh, what we know of him was that he was a righteous man and he understood what was required, the offering that God required, which was an animal sacrifice. Uh, and we uh, we don't know how he came to know that but we know that the sacrifice that he offered, which was perhaps the first of his flocks, was a, a more acceptable offering than what his brother Cain offered, which was the fruit of the ground, which was vegetation. And Cain evidently knew that, but didn't care. So Abel, having greater faith or faith in God, offered what was acceptable to God, an excellent sacrifice to King James says. Uh, Cain, being more careless or uh, not concerned about what was pleasing to God, offered something that was uh, less uh, acceptable. And God praised Abel for his gift. And of course, we know that that caused Cain, uh, so jealousy in Cain. Uh, and he eventually killed his brother Abel because of that jealousy. And what the verse tells us is that uh, even though Abel is dead, uh, his faith still sp is spoken of. Uh, in fact, we are speaking of it right now, even though uh, <laughs> uh, he was killed thousands of years ago. Uh, and uh, as a result of the sin that was brought into the world by his parents, as a result of the sin that was brought into the world as a result of his his parents or his parents sin um, we are still speaking of his faith today though he is dead and as we're going to learn uh, as we go through the other a few of the other named witnesses uh, their faith uh, uh, continues uh, they continue to uh, witness uh, to others uh, their their faith uh, continues to be a witness if you will for others uh, and so let's move on to verse 5 it says by faith Enoch now the writer is progressing through Genesis starting at the beginning with creation and then the second generation uh, Abel and Cain uh, now moving to uh, Enoch which uh, is talked about he's talked about in Genesis chapter 5 he says by faith Enoch was translated <clears throat> that he should not see death 
and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. I think that's clear enough, but let's read it from the NIV just, uh, just for any additional clarity that we might get. So from the NIV, we read, By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For well, before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And the word translated used by the King James simply means to be taken away. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Enoch. I mean, verse 5 of Genesis doesn't tell us a whole lot, but what it does tell us is powerful. It tells us that he walked with God, and that means he had a close fellowship with God, and God delighted him in him, which means he was what? Obedient to God. Uh, he desired uh, to be in God's presence and again, uh, his life and uh, the manner of his life, the conduct of his life was pleasing to God. Would to God, we could all say that. So he pleased God so much, God ridded him of his mortal coil and just pulled him up into his presence uh, out of this uh, earthly, uh, the, the, the shackles, if you will, of our flesh into his glorious presence. And the testimony was, his testimony was that he pleased God. The reason for this is because he pleased God. And again, that speaks, that is spoken of even today and is a witness of uh, the faith that he had in God and then also the delight that God had in him because of the faith he had in him and the fellowship that he shared with Enoch. So let's, let's stick a pen in the last part of that verse. His testimony was that he pleased God as we transition to verse 6, which reads, But without faith it is impossible to please him, him being God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, so we know how Enoch pleased God. Uh, Enoch uh, was, again, in close fellowship with God. We are sure, are sure he was obedient uh, to God. Uh, in fact, I would, I would think he had a, certainly a God-centered life uh, where he was focused on God uh, each and every day uh, and was led by God. And so God delighted in him. But the author gives us two requirements for faith, for genuine faith. Number one, we must believe that God exists. If we don't believe that God exists, and again, we could go back to Psalm 14, we're a fool. Uh, so that's prima facie. We must believe that he existed. He is not only existing, number two, that he rewards those who seek him. There's something to be gained when we seek him, and that is to seek to know him uh, in an intimate way, uh, not just know of him, but to know him, to know his will, to know his desires for our lives, to know what pleases him, uh, that we might walk according to uh, those things and doing those things that are pleasing to him, circumspectly before him, doing what is good in his sight, not ours, but his sight. So how do we diligently seek God today? How would you say we diligently seek God? I would say we seek him, number one, through his word. And God has revealed himself through his word. As a matter of fact, God has revealed himself in uh, three major ways. Uh, first, through creation, you know, uh, his handiwork, the, the, the glory, the splendor of his handiwork uh, reveals uh, his genius, his power to us. Uh, then through the prophets, through his word, his written word, uh, the Old Testament prophets as well as uh, the writers of the New Testament were prophets as well of a sort. Uh, and, and then lastly, 
through his son, Jesus Christ, uh, the image of the invisible God in whom uh, uh, the fullness of the, the Godhead dwell. Okay, uh, he revealed himself ultimately through Jesus Christ to us. But so we want to seek him through his word because he reveals his his nature, he reveals his power, he reveals uh, his desires for us, his love for us, he reveals, reveals his character, he reveals himself to us. And we know John chapter one says the word, uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus uh, is the embodiment of the word, the logos of God. So we seek him through his word. We certainly seek him through fellowship in prayer, through prayer and prayer guided by the Holy Spirit. If we are indeed born again believers, we are indwelt by his spirit. So we seek a closer relationship to God by being in fellowship with him and that requires certainly obedience to his word we cannot sin and expect to be in fellowship with God I know we're going to stumble but we cannot practice sin continuously and expect to be in fellowship with God even though we're saved we, we, we are in the family but we're not in fellowship with the Father until we confess and forsake that sin so we are to uh, walk uprightly circumspectly uh, as we stumble, steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Though he stumble, he will not be utterly cast down. We are to make short accounts of those stumbles, ask for forgiveness, as uh, 1 John 1 and 8 tells us, and knowing that he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And it says diligently seek him. So that means we are to be uh, earnest in our seeking of him. We are to not... Uh, uh, just dabble with the word. We're going to do some deep dives in the word, try to get clear under, un understanding of it. And, and I tell you, as much as I've studied, and uh, uh, every time I study a passage, I, I, I learn something new. So you can't never learn it all. Um, and and, I, and I, I hope that all have a diligent uh, study routine, it's a systematic routine where we study God's word. Let's move on. He gives another example in verse 7. By faith, Noah, continuing to move through Genesis here, being warned of God of things not seen yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. I'm going to quickly read that from the NIV as well. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Now, we all know about Noah. Get into Noah, I think around the 8th chapter of Genesis, actually 6 to 9, chapter 6 to 9. Give us the story of Noah. It says, he was warned, warned by God of things not yet seen. What things? Rain, for one. Water in the area that he was. A flood had never seen those things. And so the only way that he could accept those things as being the substance or the evidence of, the re of their reality is by faith. Okay, going back to verse 1. By faith he was moved, okay, with fear, and that is reverence. This is not being terrified by God, but with reverence to God to prepare the ark. And that was a, that was a huge task. Uh, my wife and I have been to the, uh, the replica of the ark over in Kentucky, and it is a beautiful thing, and it's supposed to be built to the exact dimensions of the uh, ark as specified by God uh, in Genesis. Uh, but that was an awesome task. We know that took him 120 years to do. But he did that because of faith. And we, uh, we, we certainly know that he was ridiculed by all the, all the onlookers uh, who thought perhaps he was a fool or crazy for doing that. But he did that uh, for the saving of his house. And we know there were eight souls that went into the ark. 
uh, and through them God repopulated uh, the entire earth and certainly all the animals uh, that went into the ark were used to repopulate the entire earth. And, and but, but the last part of that verse says, uh, it says, by his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Now we know that uh, 2 Peter 2.5 tells us that, that he was a preacher of righteousness and didn't know it was. Uh, and it's not to say that, you know, he was standing on the corner uh, with a, a bullhorn preaching, but uh, the work that he was doing uh, was testimony of his faith. And certainly those who uh, might inquire, uh, and certainly did, why he was doing that, he, he told them, you know, the Lord told me, the Lord told me this is going to happen. And uh, many of them uh, lived to see the reality of what uh, Noah had seen and accepted by faith uh, long before. So again, the last part of that says, became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. And this is a, this is a righteousness. This is the same righteousness that was imputed to Abraham. We go, we move further into Genesis. We see that God is going to declare Abraham righteous because Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So let's go on. And we are... Uh, going to now move into uh, verse 8 which talks about Abraham by faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed and he went out not knowing whether or where he went and that's before we, we discuss that this verse um, uh, let me just say uh, more thoroughly I should say let me say hallmark of genuine faith is uh, obedience okay uh, we, we saw that Noah not only believed what God did but he actually did what God what God was going to do rather but did what God told him to do in preparation for what he was going to do he built the ark okay which as I said was an arduous task that took over 120 years we see here that when the Lord speaks to Abraham Abraham acts on what the Lord commands him to do so this is by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place which what? He should have to receive as an inheritance. This is something that God promised him. And if you read through Genesis, God reminded him many, many times how he was going to make him a father of many nations, how his descendants were going to be like the stars in heaven, like the sand along the seashores, innumerable for multitude. And... Uh, so he was going to give him and he told him to walk the land and he told him what he was going to give him but Abraham before any of that before any of that happened Abraham was told about this by God and he was he believed him God told him to get up from where he was uh, his place of comfort uh, familiarity and move to some place he had he knew nothing about okay and that is acting on faith that is seeing the reality of something that uh, is yet to come, uh, the substance, if you will, the reality or the proof of something that is yet to come by faith. And one of the commentators says here, when God calls us to a task, as when he called Abraham to a higher mission, he calls us to trust him and to follow his directions. He says, we may never be called to head out to an open desert as Abraham was, but we will be called to many things that we cannot anticipate or imagine. God is calling us today to do things that take us out of our comfort zone, uh, things that take us into the unknown, uh, and he simply wants us to trust him for guidance and to bring us through whatever it is that uh, he intends for us to go through. Now our lesson text jumps from uh, 8, verse 8 to 13, and between those verses, verses 9, 10, and 11, and 12, speak more about Abraham uh, and about Sarah and how uh, 
they were as good as dead. They were old and beyond uh, childbearing years, and God gave them the son by faith. They um, uh, they they actually uh, Sarah conceived, and uh, and and he and he comes uh, down to uh, where Abraham was willing. I'm sorry. He's he's talking more about his descendants, how he promised his descendants uh, to be again as the, the multitude of the stars and innumerable um, as the sand which is by the seashore. So we come into verse 13, and this is the third division of our our lesson, which is from the quarterly is entitled Faith's Endurance. The standard is entitled the goal of faith. Verse 13 reads, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now he is going to mention others uh, by name. He's going to uh, to get into a spiritual, um, what's the word? Uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm, and he's just going to get on a spiritual roll and, and just rattle off uh, several others by name who live by faith and die by faith. But he's mentioning those that he's mentioned so far, uh, referring to those. He said they all died in faith. Uh, and they didn't die because of their faith, they died in faith. In other words, went to their graves still believing in the promise, uh, promises of God. And he says, not having received the promise, uh, Abraham was promised again that he would be the father of multitude. And certainly he saw some of his uh, uh, lineage, some of his descendants, but he didn't see the multitude that God had promised. And he lived long enough to see that multitude. Uh, he didn't see uh, them take possession of the land that God had promised them. Uh, he was a nomad uh, all of his life in that land, but did not see them actually take possession of it. And we know it was hundreds of years later uh, under Joshua, actually Moses and Joshua, that they came uh, in to possess that land, came to and then into to possess that land. Um, but he saw them far off okay Abraham saw them afar off what through the eyes of faith and he was persuaded of them he was convinced of their reality and embraced them and confessed uh, that these he's talking about not just Abraham but all those who've been spoken of so far that they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth they recognized that this was not their home uh, as we should this is not our home uh, we are journeying uh, through uh, this life under the sun, but this is not our home. Our home uh, is with the Lord, those of us who have trusted him uh, for our salvation. So let's take a look at verses 14 and 15. Were they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country? And truly, if they had been mindful of, the, of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return, to have returned from the uh, NIV uh, that reads uh, 14 and 15, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Verse 15, if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. So they are, uh, what he's saying is through the eyes of faith or by faith, they are looking for a better home of their own, not uh, a home in this sense, sick and dying world, but one that uh, God has promised them. Now let's understand something. They, they certainly didn't have the scripture then. Uh, they didn't know uh, uh, what a fraction of what we know about God's plan, certainly his plan for salvation. It was a mystery, as Paul said uh, throughout his epistles. Uh, but they just trusted God. They trusted that God would provide a better place for them. Uh, and that's what they look forward to. 
and they continued to follow God's leading. Uh, Abraham accepted God's promise. Uh, certainly he had opportunities to go back to Ur, as did his descendants. Uh, and had he been uh, mindful or had he been dwelling on that, oh, this is really hard out here. I had a big house in Ur, and, you know, in Haran. I had, I had all this, and now I'm out here in the desert. Uh, then he would have been distracted uh, from God's mission and, and may have been tempted to go back. Uh, we know when the children of Israel were delivered by God, who brought them out uh, on, 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 he bare them out on eagles' wings from Egypt, from bondage in Egypt. When they got out there, they started uh, craving again for the slave life, for the, the life of bondage cause, because of melons and leeks and, and so forth. And they wanted to go back to Egypt. Uh, and, and, and so they were distracted. Uh, certainly God uh, got their attention from time to time through Moses, uh, but uh, he's given examples of those who were faithful, who were steadfast in their faith, who lived by faith uh, to death, okay? Uh, and they were not tempted to go back, because certainly they had opportunities. What this verse, this uh, last verse is saying is they had opportunity to return, and they would have returned had they been so inclined if they had not been steadfast in their faith and their trust in God. Verse 16, but now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to, call the, to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. From the NIV it reads, Instead they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So, you know, this better is a key word used throughout uh, the letter to the Hebrews, the letter, the epistle uh, entitled Hebrews. Uh, we see again that, uh, uh, as, as I said in the introduction, uh, Christ was better than angels, better than Moses, better than the Aaronic priesthood, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and he offered a better and eternal sacrifice. Uh, so this is a common theme, this better, expression of better. And so when he's talking about the heroes of faith, uh, they are looking for uh, a better uh, place even though they couldn't see it uh, they knew that uh, their destination was superior to where they were uh, and, 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 and the writer goes on and said they're looking for a heavenly country uh, they, they were looking uh, to, uh, to be in the presence of God to be closer to God and again, how they envisioned heaven, uh, we don't know, uh, but they were desirous of a better place and had confidence that God would provide it. And then God, as a result of that, uh, God declares uh, he is not ashamed to be called their God. Why is he not ashamed to be called their God? Because they are trusting in him, because they're demonstrating with their lives uh, faith, continuing faith in him. I mean, the just shall live by faith, continuous faith in God, trust in him in everything. In all our ways we acknowledge him uh, uh, as we, we, we read in Proverbs 3. But now, and it, and it goes on to say, for he has prepared for them a city. Which brings to mind uh, the promise that the Lord uh, gave to uh, his disciples, his, the apostles, he said, I go to prepare, and that's, and, and by extension to all of us, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The better place is with the Lord. The better place is in his presence, uh, in joy and peace forevermore. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I often say, um, you know, Revelation gives a, uh, I guess, as enticing a description as God dare give. 
I think if it were more clear uh, what heaven was going to be like, people would be trying to leave here uh, sooner than God intends for them to. I often think of Revelations 21, in particular verse 4, and it says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. And that's not to uh, <clears throat> to say any, to speak of the, the glory of uh, the city itself uh, and, and being in the very presence of God where there's no night uh, because the glory of the Lord it makes it daylight as if it were daylight all, all day and night. Uh, now, uh, we are, 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 are given in uh, the 11th chapter of Hebrews uh, examples of living faith, of living by faith. Those who died in faith, not having received the promise that we have, okay, we, uh, they were looking forward. Again, they didn't know how God was going to do it, so they didn't know that God was going to send his son to die on the cross. But they were looking forward to God's salvation or deliverance and the preparation of a place for them. We are looking back at God's deliverance, what he did on the cross for us. But we're saved by faith. They were saved by faith. We are saved by faith. And what we want to take away from this is their example uh, of steadfastness and perhaps some thought of how we might be examples, how our faith might be examples for others, uh, younger uh, believers, those who perhaps are weaker in their faith. And I, and I, I, I say this often also, faith is, uh, uh, we don't know whether our faith is genuine until it is tried. Uh, you know, you can say you have faith, but you don't know how much or what you're having faith, what you have faith in until it's tried. And God is going to try our faith, and He tells us in James that we're to count it all joy when we fall into different trials, uh, knowing this that tribulation or trials work patience. And so we're we're to understand when we go through trials that God is doing the work in us. He is testing our faith, not for his benefit, but for our benefit, to let us know how much or how little we have. And he wants us to trust him in and through those trials, in everything and for everything. So we thank God for this privilege to share uh, in this lesson. We hope that uh, you gained a little more understanding of the passage that we covered. So Lord, we do thank and praise you again for another opportunity to study your precious word. And we thank you for then for those who uh, incline their ears to hear and we pray Lord that we would uh, use what we understand Lord of of this lesson Lord and uh, uh, in, in being more obedient and, and, and Lord in, 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 in shoring up our faith Lord uh, making our faith uh, a model Lord uh, not 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 certainly not uh, being a, a pretentious but uh, making our our genuine faith Lord a model that others can observe and be inspired by, Lord. And we do this, uh, we pray that you'll enable us to do this uh, by the power of your spirit to your praise and glory. We ask your blessings upon uh, all those uh, who are in need of healing. We ask your blessings upon all those who are bereaved. Lord, we ask that you would stay this, uh, this dread disease that has uh, washed across our land, Lord, and indeed the world is COVID and all those who love we pray that you'd comfort all those who've lost loved ones as a result of it and those who are yet suffering with it, Lord. We pray for their healing. And Lord, we just ask that you would uh, give godly wisdom to your people and that you would let your people speak out for what is good and what is right uh, and, and what is pleasing in your sight, Lord. I ask that you would help us to, to live lives that are pleasing in your sight in the upcoming week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.